Hi, my name is Gabriel Weymouth. I'm an associate professor at the University of Southampton. I study marine hydrodynamics, um, and that has to do with how water flows around kind of engineering objects like ships uh, and underwater vehicles. But I'm especially interested in how this works with biological systems and in combining those two ideas together to give biologically inspired uh, engineering. So the, today the talk's gonna be on learning fluid dynamics from animals and let's go. So one thing that's really important to understand in engineering is that when we're trying to achieve something new, you have to redefine your objectives. So one thing that's really important in engineering is that when you have really high performance objectives, you need to use novel design concepts. So for instance, this is a hydrofoiling boat. It was the first large, fast hydrofoiling boat. Uh, the moths were developed before this, but this boat was developed specifically to sail over 50 knots. And to do that, they had to use all kinds of new engineering techniques, new fluid mechanics, new solid mechanics, materials, new sailing techniques, everything. They had to throw out the old book and come up with something new. Uh, here's another example. So this is the US DDG 1000. It's a naval vessel. And the idea here was to make a ship that's actually radar stealth. And that's why they had to make everything with these flat panels and straight lines. But ships don't look like this typically. And they had a bunch of problems that they had to overcome in order to make sure the boat was safe in high seas and things like that. Um, so again, they had to kind of throw out the book and adopt a bunch of new ideas. Um, and this is also the case when we're talking about underwater exploration. So this is a sunken ship and the kinds of vehicles that we use to explore these sorts of underwater wrecks or to do other kind of underwater surveys aren't really ideal. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a bit. There was even kind of an X prize on this and continues to be ocean X prizes that are pointed towards effectively exploring the deep ocean. So let's talk about current underwater vehicles and what's wrong with them. So first of all, this is what underwater vehicles typically look like. They uh, are really pretty limited because they look like this torpedo. So you can see it's just a torpedo shaped yellow object there with a propeller in the back. Um, and that means that they're very good at going straight, but going in a straight line isn't always what we want to do. Um, they're not very good at getting in and out of the water. That's what this kind of net thing is for, is to help this guy get back inside. And that's because they have pretty limited agility but having an agile robot would be really helpful if you're trying to explore a shipwreck or something like that. Um, here's a simulation of the flow around a ship like that uh, when it's trying to make a turn. So here are all of these colors. This is showing that there's a lot of turbulence behind this vehicle as it tries to make a turn. And all of this turbulence, this is stirred up water and that means that we have to put a lot of energy into stirring up the water instead of into moving in the direction we want to move. And that means that you kind of have a limited battery life in, for a vehicle like this. So in practice, when people try to do exploration underwater, they much more often use these remotely operated vehicles. This is an example from Oceaneering. Um, they were involved in, say, the Titanic um, exploration. And this is just a brick. It's an underwater box and it's connected with a cable to the surface and that lets it get a continual input of power. And since it's a brick, it doesn't move very quickly in any direction, uh, but at least it doesn't kind of veer into stuff and ran into it very often. But it's not really ideal. Uh, for one, the tether is a big problem if you're trying to get in and around stuff. So in this picture, the vehicle is inspecting some oil equipment and if it gets tangled up in that equipment uh, the tether is a real liability uh, also this kind of vehicle isn't any isn't autonomous at all it's remotely operated by people on the surface and that's a very difficult job and human operators are expensive so let's think about throwing out those old ideas 
and looking at something completely different. Um, so biologically inspired concepts might be able to overcome those two limitations, those being kind of a limited agility requiring outsourced power. Maybe we can do better. Um, this is just a still image of three sea lions, seals playing, uh, but what we can learn from these is a lot. So here we have an image of three underwater animals playing, and what we can tell very quickly is that they change their shape depending on what they do. So the guy in the background, we can tell that they're going straight in a straight line because they've assumed that torpedo shape, which is optimal for going in a straight line. But the two in the front don't look like this at all. We can tell what they're doing, even though this isn't a movie. They're playing with each other, spinning around in spirals. And that's because they've adopted a shape, which is optimal for that. Um, and this is pretty much the problem with those first two AUVs, is that they didn't change shape in any way. They're only good at doing one thing for that reason. So the goal then here is to see about stealing that idea and applying it to underwater vehicles. Now, the idea of taking inspiration from biology isn't a new thing. This is uh, some sketches. So the sketch here is from Leonardo da Vinci uh, for a flying machine. And actually, people have done engineering analysis on this uh, little sketch. And it would have worked if the musculature of a human was strong enough but it isn't. Uh, this vehicle can't fly when a human powers it. If we get some robots involved to help flap these wings, then this design actually has a chance of helping. And obviously that's been inspired by a bird flying. Um, and we're still doing this kind of thing. So much more recently, we have done things like design these uh, micro weight gliders. So these guys are much, much, much longer span and a very, very simple mechanism. And again, it's based on the idea of gliding birds. So one thing that we might notice is that that last picture didn't look like a bird. It was still biologically inspired, however. So this is kind of a difference between biomimetics, where we're trying to reproduce an animal, versus biologically inspired engineering, where we're trying to steal or copy off of some of the characteristics of an animal, trying to figure out what it does well and reproduce that with an engineering system. That doesn't mean we need to put a beak on this uh, flying vehicle. It means that we need really long, slender wings. Uh, those are the things that are important, and those are the things we capitalize on here. So for the application we're talking about, what's really important about animals here that we can steal is the way that they use unsteady shapes to generate unsteady fluid dynamics and use that to great advantage. So this is another clip. Here's a bird uh, perched and then an instant later it's up in the air with its wings fully extended and an instant later it's down here dive bombing with its wings pushed back. This is all happening in a fraction of a second and because it's doing three different things it has three different shapes and this is the way it becomes efficient and very maneuverable, and uh, that's what we want. So let's steal off of these biology uh, prototypes, these animals who've been doing it for so long, and we're going to do that with some engineering techniques. So I'm gonna talk about two research projects that I've been involved in over the last few years, both of which are working toward those kind of fast, uh, maneuverable underwater vehicles. The first one based off of a plesiosaur and the second one based off of an octopus. So the plesiosaur trying to really look at that maneuverability in a simple mechanical way and the octopus looking to be very fast in its acceleration, uh, kind of like a drag vehicle but for underwater. All right, so here's the example for the maneuvering plesiosaur-like robot. So you can see we've got these four flippers and an underwater vehicle. This is a video that was taken by some undergraduate students who built this robot with me, uh, supervising them a few years ago. So first, uh, we should figure out what a plesiosaur is. It was a Mesozoic maritime uh, or marine reptile. Um, it was secondarily aquatic, so like a whale. Its ancestors were air-breathing 
uh, on the land and they went back into the water again and they were highly successful so they were found all over the world we found fossils all over the world and they lived for an extremely long period of time so it's not like this is a one-off design uh, that was never repeated uh, this was a very successful branch of animals that lived for a very long time but what's interesting for us is that they had this unique swimming method of using four big flippers. This is in contrast to turtles or the sea lions we saw before, uh, where the front flippers were the only ones that really mattered. Um, the back ones are tiny. Here with the plesiosaur, we've got four big maneuvering flippers. So why might you want that? So number one, I mentioned just now. So what's really interesting about this is that the plesiosaur had four large flippers. That's in contrast to say a sea turtle or a penguin or any number of other uh, animals that swim under the water that pretty much just have two large flippers. The plesiosaur had four. Uh, so why would the plesiosaur do this? There's two probable reasons. Number one is maneuvering. Uh, so having four large flippers would let you generate forces in a large variety of ways, not just the ways of two. So this is a remotely operated vehicle called Finnegan that was developed at MIT in 2008. And that used four flippers for this reason alone, just to try to get the highly maneuverable vehicle. Um, another reason is that the back flippers, the hind flippers, can see an increase in both thrust and efficiency. So this is a video of a simulation that we developed a few years ago. It's a single flipper moving up and down. So this is like a slice through the flipper and we're looking at a cross section of the flow. And this blue and red visualization is talking about the rotation of the fluid. And while it's a little bit difficult to see, what's happening here effectively is that as the object, as the foil moves up and down through it's accelerating this flow in the middle. And all of this stuff, which is being accelerated, the red highlighted part here, that's really the thrust. So by pushing the fluid hard in one direction, we generate an equal and opposite force in the other direction. And that's how this foil can be used to propel itself. This is how all kind of flapping propulsion works. So what happens when you put two flippers together? you probably would expect to get two bits of thrust. Um, and indeed, we certainly do see a much larger set of these swirling vortices, and we get a larger amount of acceleration in the back. But it turns out we don't just get double the thrust. We end up getting almost triple the thrust. So adding one more flipper behind ends up being much better in terms of increasing your thrust and increasing your efficiency. You're kind of uh, coasting, sort of the way that uh, you can coast behind someone when you're riding your bicycle. You can draft behind them to reduce your drag. Similarly, this back foil is using the front wake, using the wake of the front foil, and together they can produce way more than either one could in isolation. So this is a set of experiments that were done uh, here at Southampton, where we've got these kind of foil shapes, which were based off of actual plesiosaur uh, skeletons that were found, plesiosaur fossils that were found. And we measured experimentally that the thrust of this combined system was 60% bigger than either of the foils in isolation would be, and 40% more efficient. Uh, so this is exactly the kind of trick that we'd be looking for to in prove our underwater vehicles. So based off of those experiments, this group of students that I was supervising decided to actually make an underwater vehicle like this. Um, they wanted to make it as simple as possible. So that Finnegan robot that I showed you before needed eight underwater motors, uh, which are all very expensive. So they designed a much cheaper version that only required two motors, one in one that controls one side and one that controls the other side. And those motors go inside the chassis here. And then they just used a crank system to push both of the pins. So these are driven together. So each side operates kind of in tandem as you want. 
And then the pitching motion around each of these axes is totally passive. So they're just uh, on some simple, they're just as limited in how far they can rotate, but otherwise they're free, free to flap up and down. Yeah, so here's the total system, and then we multiply that by four. All right, so here's the results. There's one of the guys. We've got a little GoPro underwater. So here you can see that central area that's holding the batteries and the computer, and the two motors are just behind that central part. And you can see those all run together. As soon as the motor's turned on, then the thing tries to swim away. Right now it's tied down, so it can't. So here's a couple more videos where it's not been tethered in space. The things sticking out the top here are some motion tracking dots so that we could measure the speed, although you can see quite clearly the stick is really slowing it down. Um, but even then, we were able to measure cruising speeds of about 0.6 meters per second, uh, which is about the same as most underwater vehicles, so that's totally accurate uh, or adequate for any kind of need. And it's able to do this kind of trick, which is very atypical of an underwater vehicle. So it can turn in place without any forward speed. So if you had a camera on here and you wanted to pan left or right, you could do that without losing your shot at all, um, which is the sort of thing that would be really, really fantastic for a remotely operated or autonomous underwater vehicle. And if you're moving at speed and you want to make a turn, that's also very, very easy to do. You can do it in about half a body length. And the total cost of this, because it's only using two motors, was only about a thousand pounds, plus, of course, a lot of effort out of the students who designed it. So this was a pretty big uh, success, and we're pretty proud of that. Uh, the next one was well, the octopus-inspired one. So the main driver for this was that standard propulsion methods, like a propeller, so this is a picture of a propeller, there's some problems trying to get propellers to quickly accelerate anything underwater. So it's very hard to make a boat jump forward at high speed. Uh, if you think about why that might be important for an underwater vehicle, say that something is coming up and that you need to very quickly get out of the way. That's certainly why animals have this ability to jet start. Um, or maybe you are moving at speed and then you want to turn around and give yourself a burst of acceleration to stop so you don't run into something. Um, and propellers are bad at both of those. So this is a video showing cavitation, or a still image from a video of cavitation. So all of these are little air bubbles underneath here, which are being caused by the load on the propeller being too high. This damages the propeller, it causes a lot of noise, it's definitely not the sort of thing you want to do. So here's the contrasting case of an octopus. This is from uh, Roger Hamlin at the Marine Biology Lab in Cape Cod, and you can see this octopus fills up with water and then jets away at high speed, and jets much faster than the person can follow, giving himself plenty of room to get out of the way and escape any kind of predator. And so we were very interested in how this works and trying to make a biologically inspired vehicle that could do the same thing. So we did this with the soft robotic prototype. So soft robotics is the idea that we don't need to make everything rigid. Uh, usually in engineering, we're trying to make sure nothing moves that we don't want. But if we can be a little more flexible, then we could take advantage of things bending and changing shape. So in this case, we've 3D printed a rigid frame over which we pull just a party balloon. Uh, and this rigid membrane Make sure that we keep a nice streamlined shape when the balloon is empty, but we can change the shape by filling it up. And this is a little nozzle that will pump water into this. So it's a very, very simple uh, prototype. Yep. <laughs> so it's pretty fast. Here it's full of water, and as soon as you release it, it shoots across, uh, emptying out that water and deflating. So the two things that we're getting here is that we start from this very large shape. As soon as you let go, uh, we start jetting away and we start changing shape, both things. So by the end, we're a nice streamlined shape way down the road. So here's uh, that same video, except uh, a little bit of image processing to increase the contrast between the balloon and the background. 
And what we can see is this whole thing happens in one second. Each of these is a tenth of a second. And in a tenth of a second, we're moving about a body length. So we're moving at 10 body lengths per second by the end of this. Here's another version of exactly the same thing again. We can use motion capture again, now underwater motion capture, and we can get the velocity profile. So in less than a second, we accelerate from no forward speed up to about 10 body lengths per second. And there's some variability in this, uh, and we've just kind of fit a smooth curve. So sometimes we're getting almost 12 body lengths per second, but we're always getting around 10 at least as our peak. Um, and another really interesting thing about this is that that extremely fast 10 body lengths per second was achieved just with the strength of a party balloon, which is not exactly a super, super fast or strong medium. So this tells you that this is probably a very efficient vehicle, a very efficient way of accelerating. So let's do a little comparison. Uh, a rocket in space is a pretty efficient thing to move and accelerate. Uh, but it has a limit because you have to push fuel in one direction. Uh, you can't get acceleration for free. And there's a maximum efficiency of 65%. You have to waste 35% on accelerating fuel. Uh, that isn't what you want. And so 65% is the best as you can do. Uh, underwater, it seems like you'd be much worse because you have to move a bunch of liquid around. You've got drag, all kinds of stuff. But our measured efficiency is 68%. So this is the quasi-propulsive efficiency, saying how much effort did we do and how much fuel did we spend to do it. But we're actually getting 68% efficiency, meaning that our efficiency is better than the maximum for a rocket in space. So that's pretty fun. Uh, there's other advantages to using soft robotics too. Things like we don't have to worry about running into stuff underwater. So if we're inspecting some kind of energy harvesting device, like underwater tidal turbines, or if we're looking at coral reefs or shipwrecks, we don't have to worry about damaging stuff if we're pretty soft. And it's a lot cheaper uh, to make these soft robotics than trying to make really, really hard pressure vessels to resist pressure. Um, here's some new stuff. Instead of a single shot, this is a vehicle which can pulse and continue propelling itself underwater. It's a little bit like an umbrella, basically. So this blue section back here is, again, just a rubber membrane. Now it's being stretched over a movable uh, shell instead of a rigid shell like before. And by opening and closing that shell, we can force water in and out. There's no net fluid, it's just moving back and forth, but we still get a net thrust, which is very capable of moving this little robot at high speed. All right, and again, this is a super efficient uh, propulsion method. So, biologically inspired devices, they're efficient, they're maneuverable, they're inexpensive, and they could really improve underwater safety. Uh, so that's why I work on them, and I hope you guys found that interesting. If you have any questions, you could contact me. My email address is here at the bottom, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Hi, my name is Mia. I'm the Acting Program Lead at A-Space Arts. I'd like to thank you for watching this video, and if you can spare a few pennies for GHT, please follow the link in the description below to donate to our PayPal account. The money you donate will help support the organisation through this difficult time and allow us to continue developing content like this to keep us all entertained at home. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here and hitting subscribe and you can watch more quality content from GHT by clicking here. Thanks again everybody and stay safe.